The Mediterranean Sea, the island of Crete, 15th century BC. One of archaeology's greatest mysteries is the disappearance of Atlantis, the legendary lost continent. No trace of this extinct civilization has ever been found, yet the legend endures. Many archaeologists think that the myth of Atlantis is in some way connected to another great civilization, that of the Minoans. The Minoan civilization, which flourished in Crete in the 3rd and 2nd millennia BC, in parallel with the more famous Egyptian civilization, did not have the privilege of ending up in the history books of the ancients because it disappeared so suddenly, just like Atlantis. The association of Atlantis with Crete and the Minoans is supported by recent discoveries emerging from excavations, discoveries that reveal a highly advanced civilization, unequaled for centuries, a civilization which enjoyed a long golden age. Come with us as we explore the amazing ancient civilization of the Minoans. In ancient civilizations from the 2nd and 3rd millennia BC, it is the Egyptians who occupy the limelight for their dazzling sculpture and art, the hieroglyphics they left behind, the royal tombs, and the incredible architecture, including, of course, the pyramids. In the Egypt of those times, merchants traded exquisitely beautiful vases, now known as chimeras. It was said they came from an island in the middle of the Mediterranean, a rich, sweet and peaceful island, a paradise. The description enticed many Egyptians who wanted to visit. Travelers would change boats in various ports as they moved up the coasts of Lebanon, Cyprus and the islands of the southern Aegean. One of the first remarkable sites they would encounter was Mount Ida, 8,058 feet high in the middle of the island of Crete. In the second millennium BC, Crete was the center of a vast domain that encompassed most of the islands in the Aegean. For this reason, the Minoan civilization named after Minos, the legendary king of Crete, was also called the Aegean Civilization. On the south coast of Crete, archaeologists found traces of a Minoan settlement, Aia Triata. The excavation work unearthed a huge villa and one unusual object among the many relics found. Its painted sides depict a procession the figures in line are all smiling, serene, and joyful. The object, however, is indisputably a sarcophagus, and the procession, in spite of its apparent happiness, can only be a funeral procession. By studying images and artifacts left by the Minoans, archaeologists discovered that everything on Crete, even a funeral, was related to joy and nature an ode to life. This contrasted sharply with the seriousness of Egyptian funerals with their rigid cult of the dead. Archaeologists also found these stone vases at Aia Triada, carved from black steatite, one of antiquity's most beautiful materials. 
The images on the ancient vases tell us of the world in which they lived. One character, proud and handsome, attracted the attention of scholars who sought to understand who he might be. The solution to the puzzle could not be found in any written histories. The information left to us by ancient historians is imperfect anyway, since it's based on legend and not direct observation. The only narrative we have of Crete and the Minoans is the legendary story of King Minos, whose description matches quite closely with the character depicted on the steatite vase. The resemblance is so strong that many have declared it is, in fact, an image of the king. Perhaps the only Minoan image of Minos that exists is found on this vase. The great legend tells of a monstrous figure, the Minotaur, half man, half bull, born of the union of a white bull with Pasiphae, King Minos's wife. Upon seeing their hideous offspring, the king had the Minotaur locked up in a labyrinth. Every nine years, Minos would feed seven young men and women from Athens to the Minotaur. Eventually, Theseus, the son of the king of Athens, decides to kill the Minotaur. On his way, he meets Ariadne, the daughter of Minos, who falls in love with him. Ariadne gives Theseus a ball of silken twine to unspool as he enters the maze so he can find his way out. Theseus kills the Minotaur and escapes the island, taking Ariadne with him. Minos, in a rage, locks up the designer of the maze, Daedalus, but he too escapes, along with his ill-fated son, Icarus, on waxen wings. It would seem then that a dark cloud hangs over the Cretan world. But archaeologists warn us to distrust histories invented by one people to account for their enemies. The legend of the Minotaur was written by the ancient Greeks, and the Greeks were the enemies of the Minoans. The Minoans cannot defend themselves against such accusations. Their writing still remains undecipherable. Their alphabet, the so-called Linear A, is a puzzle, and one of modern archaeology's major challenges lies on a Minoan ceramic disc, the Phaistus disc. When it was found in Phaistus, archaeologists were intrigued by its spiral markings. But unlike the readable glyphs left by the Egyptians, these markings left by the Minoans remain an enigma for modern scholars. In spite of this, the disc reveals something quite extraordinary. The markings are printed, not painted, and each one represents a syllable. The disc thus contains a text, one of the first printed texts in human history thousands of years before Gutenberg. Toward the end of the 1800s, an English archaeologist, Arthur Evans, found these dusty, interesting seals at an Athens antique market. He discovered that they had come from Crete and decided to dig there at Knossos. He began to discover the remains of elaborate and finely decorated dwellings. The floors of the houses were perfectly stacked, one having collapsed onto the other as if an earthquake or similar catastrophe had suddenly struck the city. Evans rebuilt everything that could be put back together, but the more he dug, the more he realized how strange the buildings were. The rooms, over 1,500 of them, were all interconnected, as if the whole area had been covered by a single huge palace as big as a city. All around, there were large stone horns and images of bulls. Evans understood that Knossos was an extraordinary city palace unlike any ever seen before, a city labyrinth where the bull was widely venerated. He thus discovered the legendary palace of Minos, the labyrinth of Theseus, and the secret of the Minotaur.
Actually, the Minoans, as we see in this fresco, did not have an antagonistic relationship with bulls. They played with them. They didn't kill them. In Crete, they did not practice what today we'd call bullfighting, but rather something called Toro Cathopsia, a balancing contest on the backs of the massive beasts. In ancient times, the labyrinth city of Knossos was constantly evolving. The architecture would have seemed very different to the Egyptians who might have visited. The roof had openings designed to capture and channel water, but also to allow light to penetrate the interior. Light entered both from above and through openings in the four walls. The structure comprised two units, which were different from one another, but each had floors that were exactly identical. Today, thanks to the excavation work of Evans, we can project what this incredible palace actually looked like. It was a great maze that on the outside featured an intricate interlocking series of stepped terraces. Unlike the Egyptians, whose people lived in mud huts while mammoth constructions like the pyramids were erected to honor the afterlife, here was a people who created huge and grandiose structures not for celebrating death, but for living life with joy. The heart of Minoan life the gathering place for amusement, the place where the events with the bulls were held, was this courtyard. High above, looking down upon all the pageantry, were the royal apartments. The central courtyard contained both the rooms reserved for the royal family and enough outdoor space for the festivals of the citizens of Knossos. It was a democratic setup that allowed the different social classes to mix more readily. The center of Minoan power, the throne room, also looked out onto the courtyard. What is amazing is that the throne room of this ancient city is still intact today, and Minos's original throne is still in its place. This throne, in all its symbolic power, has been copied and now seats the president of the International Court of The Hague. This homage to the Minoan civilization came about thanks to the work of archaeologists who debunked the Greek myth of the Minotaur and restored to Minos his rightful fame as a fair and just king. In the Minoan society, women were equal to men. Today we might say liberated and emancipated. They wore colorful clothes and adorned themselves with precious jewelry. They played an important organizational role in daily life and were the animators of court activities. In fact, one of the most beautiful rooms in the entire city palace of Knossos was dedicated to a woman. Here we make our way through the colorful corridors of the palace to the queen's chambers. In this apartment, more than anywhere else, one can see just how dearly the Minoans felt about physical well-being and comfort. In addition to festive decorations found everywhere, on the door frames, walls and ceilings, this set of rooms was characterized by refined sanitary facilities 
and by double walls to keep the noise out. Statuettes of women lying dormant for thousands of years were brought to light in the Knossos digs. Their clothing is elegant, and in a unique fashion, their breasts were left exposed. This fact incited both curiosity and divergent opinions. Scholars debated whether that was normal wear for Minoan women, or if it was exclusive to certain priestesses linked to a particular cult of worship. women portrayed with serpents in their hands are certainly priestesses. Their garb is sacral. But the excavations also yielded dozens of paintings where bare-breasted women appear in scenes of daily life. This fact led scholars to believe that this uninhibited mode of dressing was widespread among Minoan women. The belief is also supported by observations of many other Cretan paintings. The Minoans were completely immersed in a benevolent natural environment, as mild as the climate of these latitudes, and one that they fully delighted in. The artifacts unearthed by archaeologists present a new image of the Minoan civilization, not the legendary gloom of a fatal labyrinth, but a lush and joyful Eden. Crete, the home of King Minos and the civilization he began, was the center of a large empire that included hundreds of neighboring islands in the Cyclades, one of the most captivating areas in the world. One island in this group is Santorini, once known as Caliste, literally the most beautiful. The igneous rock that covers most of Santorini is the ancient residue of a volcano that is still active. The volcano expels a compound that produces a sand particularly well suited to making mortar, and the island has many quarries to extract it. In one of these quarries, remains were found of ancient walls, which immediately attracted archaeologists' attention. Excavations unearthed buildings and relics that had nothing in common with the ancient Greek civilization. After pottery, frescoes, and an entire village were found, a few hypotheses were advanced. It was clear that a tremendous eruption had buried the village with sand and ash, which later solidified. The village, known as Akrotiri, was thus connected to one of the greatest natural disasters in history, the disappearance of half the island of Santorini into the sea in about 1500 BC. The frescoes and the pottery, very similar to those found in Knossos and Phaistos, suggested that Akrotiri was one of the many commercial ports along the routes used by the Minoans in their crossings of the Mediterranean, trading their highly refined products. It was a culturally rich city, worthy of the civilization that we now define as Minoan, and the dwellings are the proof. The houses of Akrotiri had two or three floors, and were built with a light and very elegant style. They all exhibited a great number of openings, allowing air circulation and filling the rooms with light. As in the Cretan palaces, the perimeter walls contained the drain pipes for the sanitary facilities that all discharged into what was an incredible thing for the time, a sewer network. The stairs and floors had a flexibility to them. The attic had wooden beams and a network of reeds and branches, lightweight materials covered with finely packed earth. 
What is the explanation for such a building technique? The volcano, now and then, caused tremors that shook the island. The houses of Akrotiri were built this way as a sort of elementary but effective anti-seismic system. The Minoans lived in a rich and verdant land. In Crete, abundant water flowed down from Mount Ida to irrigate the fields. They were surrounded and defended by the sea, which they sailed as the uncontested masters. They lived in a society without conflicts. And yet, their civilization suddenly disappeared. Archaeologists wondered how a civilization that had left such significant and impressive traces could have come to ruin so quickly and mysteriously. In putting together pieces of the puzzle, Archaeologists realized that a catastrophe like the explosive eruption of Santorini would have disastrous consequences even beyond the island itself. They calculated that the half of the island that sank into the sea would displace an enormous amount of water and generate a tidal wave towering a hundred feet or more. Its direction could only have been toward the south, where it would strike Crete and Knossos. As confirmation that the tidal wave really did hit Crete, archaeologists found the remains of boats high on the slopes of Mount Ida. The Santorini volcano not only destroyed half the island and buried Akrotiri in ash, but it also wiped out the famous and powerful Minoan fleet, the loss of which left them exposed and vulnerable to conquest by the Mycenaeans. A civilization nurtured by the sea had been undone by its fury. Discoveries by archaeologists regarding the advanced state and the fate of the Minoan civilization, along with the disappearance of the island of Santorini, have much in common with another enduring mystery. For centuries, scholars have tried to resolve the location of Atlantis, the lost continent. The myth of Atlantis originated with the writings of Plato, it was fabled to be a happy world, experiencing a golden age, an island that was a true natural paradise, enhanced by bold works of hydraulic engineering. At the center of this island, there was an enormous residential complex immersed in a forest. And all of this was swallowed up one day by the sea. Plato had indicated the position of Atlantis was beyond the columns of Hercules, the rock of Gibraltar, in the Atlantic Ocean. But he had his information third-hand, citing the sage Solon, who in turn had gotten his news from Egyptian priests. So there are scholars today who strongly believe, given the many similarities with the Minoan world, that the disappearance of Atlantis was none other than the disappearance of the island of Santorini, and the sudden decline of the Minoan civilization. What is certain is that archaeologists have found nothing similar to Atlantis or to Knossos or to the Minoan civilization in any of the peoples who came later. The Mycenaeans, ancestors of the Greeks, after subduing the Minoans, created a much coarser, more retrograde civilization, as if humanity had taken a great step backwards. Whether or not the legend of Atlantis was inspired by the Minoans and the Santorini volcano disaster, nothing detracts from the intriguing world that archaeologists have uncovered for us. The incredible artifacts left behind, their respect for the giving nature of the environment, the civility and lifestyle of the Minoans, all suggest that if this civilization had not disappeared, our world today might be a very different place. The Minoans did not get the chance to expand, to pass on the richness of their culture. They were not able to perpetuate their golden age. But what little has remained of their civilization seems to have influenced the world's sense of beauty from generation to generation down through classical Greece and modern Western civilization. And so today, we can be justified to feel that we are the children of the Cretan world, 
a world that celebrated the beauty and the value of women. Strong ethics, as represented by the fair and just King Minos. A civilization to whom a labyrinth was only a game and the stuff of legends. A civilization that seemed to emerge from the dark ages and learned to celebrate and live life as it was meant to be lived.